So I'm, I'm Jason. I'm the uh, Waste Education Officer for Hume. And yeah, so we've been rolling out a uh, follower program and uh, doing a lot of engagement to try and encourage people to do a lot more composting as well. Uh, so that's what this presentation is today. So hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, Ella, who is a wonderful leader here in the of Compost Collective, is brilliant uh, with all this stuff. So hopefully we've, I know we've got a really great presentation for you today, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'll be manning the uh, questions and answers. So if you have any questions, there's a little prompt down the bottom. So like a little chat feed that you can tap into. So if you got any issues or anything like that, put it in the chat or any questions, we will answer some of them on the way if you want some more detail. And yeah, so if anybody has any trouble connecting as well, I put my post, my work email there in the invite that went out. So if you have any questions afterwards or something went wrong during the presentation, let me know and uh, we'll get straight out for you. Brilliant. We'll just wait one more minute while we uh, get everybody on board. get started now there's no one in the waiting room so Jason if you can continue to add people from the waiting room if I miss them um, then yeah they can maybe just catch up as we go yep so yeah hopefully that just sort of pops up on my screen should do oh. but um it's popping up on mine anyway so, <laughs> okay, yeah. well, welcome everyone and thanks for coming. Um, it's a pretty gloomy day out there, so it's um, probably quite a good day to sit inside and <laughs> watch a webinar on how to, uh, how to compost rather than go out and do it. Um, I have temporarily moved undercover because it's, um, yeah, it's pretty wet out there and uh, my computer, I didn't want it to short out partway through the session. So we will be going out and looking at those compost systems unless it's just torrential in which case we'll ad lib <laughs> do something a bit differently um so just to get started um everyone's on mute obviously most people have done plenty of zoom workshops by now um so just yeah if there's any any distractions um just keep it to a minimum pop your questions in chat as jason mentioned he will um be you know, making sure that uh, they get answered. So we will have time for questions at the end, uh, but any burning questions about anything that I'm saying that's just not making sense and you want clarification, we'll obviously do at the time, but you'll find most questions will get answered as we go on. Um, and I um, will be sending a copy of this presentation to Jason and also um, the video link as well, if you want it uh, and that way, yeah, you can revisit it. So no need to madly take notes. <laughs> um, hopefully I'll give you lots of good tips. I certainly in an hour won't be covering everything that you can learn about composting, but hopefully give you a good understanding so that you feel quite confident to give it a good red hot go. Um, so what we're going to look at, first of all, food waste, what is the issue? Why does it even matter? Why does council invest in minimizing food waste. Um, then we're gonna look at the various options in Hume. There are a few different options in Hume uh, and you might want to sort of follow a combination of options. Uh, we're gonna then look at how to compost um, and by composting, we're gonna cover a few different systems including a fermentation system and a worm farm system. Uh, and of course, Compost Community, which is a council's program that we assist with um, to get subsidised compostings into people's homes, well, gardens, technically. <laughs> and um, of course, more time for questions. Okay, so food waste, just to begin um, with an understanding of food waste, we break food waste into two categories avoidable food waste and unavoidable food waste. So avoidable food waste is things that have just gone off that we didn't get around to eating. Um, so at one stage it started off perfectly edible um, as opposed to unavoidable food waste, which is things like your banana peels, um, you know, stuff that 
there's not really an easy way to eat them. <laughs> Although um, we will teach you some good tips on recycling them in the backyard. Uh, and of course, um, there's that group in the middle of, of food waste that are unavoidable food waste such as carrot tops, but that doesn't mean you can't make um, you know, a stock out of them or something. So, um, so we generally just group them into the two main, the two main topics, uh, and that way we can reduce or minimise our food waste already just by thinking about you know what we buy and what we use and how we store it. So there's lots of impacts along um, the whole chain of um, food, you know, from every, all the resources that go into growing it and then picking it and packing it and then storing it and transporting it. Um, if we're buying food from overseas, for example, it's spending a lot of time on ships or planes and there's all these greenhouse gas emissions. So there's so many resources along the way before it even gets to the stage of being in our kitchen and then potentially being wasted or being composted. So, um, reducing food waste at the forefront is obviously a priority. And of course, with food miles, which is the distance food travels to our plate, there's other issues such as, um, you know, nutrition value. So, you know, the longer something's stored, the more nutrition it loses. Whereas if you pick something fresh from the garden, it's beautiful and nutritious and usually tastes a heck of a lot better anyway. Uh, and then of course, through disposing of food, if we don't dispose of it in the right way, there's the issue of methane. So uh, methane is a greenhouse gas that's 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide over a 100 year period. Um, but if you were just to calculate it, you know, initially, it's something like 75 times more potent a greenhouse gas. So we want to avoid making methane by avoiding chucking food in the bin, basically. Um, so hopefully by the end of today, you'll be really empowered to, uh, to reduce your food waste in the first place, but then to do the right thing with everything that's left over. So I'm just gonna show you a little video, which I will just open. Oh, the joys of technology. Here we go. Now, when it gets started, I will just pause just to make sure that you can. Now, can I just, for anyone that's on pause, you can just hit the space bar to speak to me, um, just to tell me that you could hear that little jingle. Yes, I can. Great, thank you. All right, I will play the video. Meet the Australian fridge. Bursting with food, but how much of it do we actually eat? Less than you might think. Australians throw out 4.45 million tonnes of food every year. 936 kilograms for every household. All up, that's about a quarter of the food we buy. The equivalent of $5.2 billion. More than we spend on the army. And that's only the tip of the food burg. We also waste the food it takes to grow the food. Consider what goes into a steak. 40% of all the wheat, rice and corn humans grow is used to feed animals. In developed countries, every kilo of beef requires about 10 kilos of cereals and up to 100,000 litres of water. Our squeamishness makes us even bigger wasters. Most Australians are only willing to eat certain parts of the animals we slaughter. 46% of the edible cow carcass is sold off cheaply for pet food and other uses. What does go to the supermarket shelf can also be wasted. 7% will be thrown away by the store, unsold or damaged, and 30% will be discarded in our homes, uncooked or left over. Vegetables aren't free from cost either. Every kilo of potatoes takes 500 litres of water to produce. Throwing out a kilo of white rice wastes 1,550 litres. Oh, and it costs 140 litres of water to make a cup of coffee. And then there's the beauty test. It's estimated that 20 to 40% of all fruit and vegetables are rejected by supermarkets because they don't meet visual standards. In Queensland, 100,000 tonnes of bananas, about a third of the annual crop, are thrown out each year because they aren't pretty enough yeah. or because they've fallen from a tree and touched the ground. And according to the CSIRO, 54% of Australian mangoes, more than half of the fruit produced, is thrown away. If you add up the food Australia wastes each year, it's enough to fill 720,000 garbage trucks. Placed end to end, 
the convoy would bridge the gap between Australia and New Zealand four times. To put that in perspective, just a quarter of the food wasted in the first world could feed all the people starving in the third world. Your fridge. Just another rest stop on the wasteful journey from farmyard to rubbish tip. So quite eye-opening how much food is wasted. Um, so yes, just reiterating the um, you know the benefits of reducing food waste and of course then composting. Um, now I'm going to take you through some different compost systems. I'll, what I'm going to do is share my presentation and what you can do is toggle your screen so you have the window of me and the presentation equal size side by side so you can see what I'm doing in the background as well. So bear with me just a sec while I bring it up. Um, so I think I have a different view to you guys <laughs> as the host, but I, I think there's um, three little dots and you can just drag um, the screen around so that you can see a little bit more. Um, and what I can do is stop sharing anyway once we, um, you know, move into showing some of the various compost systems. So starting off, we'll look at the organics recycling options in HUME. Um, there's a few, there's FOGO, which stands for Food Organics, Garden Organics. There's home composting, of course. Uh, and then there's some community options as well. So community options, um, you know, getting involved with the community and sharing it around for various systems. So FOGO, um, or Food Organics, Garden Organics, um, is basically using your garden waste bin, your green waste bin, in order to dispose of your food waste. And you can um, put pretty much anything, any of your food wastes in there, meat, bones. Um, I've heard some people putting in like leftover cooking oil and that type of thing. Uh, and you can just wrap it in newspaper to sort of stop it going everywhere and leaching everywhere but you can't put it in bags so don't put it in even those compostable bags um, they actually interfere with the system that's processing it so just loose um, in in newspaper is fine um, it is collected fortnightly so you want to think about layering it so it doesn't smell so perhaps you'll wrap some food in newspaper and put it in and then put your grass clippings on top um, but it certainly doesn't replace home composting. It's a really nice complement for things that you just can't compost at home. Um, or, you know, if you don't have the space to compost, this might be your only option. But some people don't have a green waste bin, so the other option might be to compost. Um, so using it in combination, um, potentially even, you know, working together with your neighbours um, is a really great way to divert waste to landfill. But the whole idea is so that it goes into this bin and not into the landfill bin where it does create methane. Um, then of course there's home composting which you can buy a system or you can make a system. So I'm going to, if I can just make this a little bit bigger just so I can see as well. Okay, so um, lots of different systems out there, um, commercially available as well as others. The first one I'm just going to show you here is basically just a cage. So this is just a compost cage. I've got it propped open with a red chair because I overfilled it a little bit. And um, that's just basically where I've raked up all my leaf and all my brown litter that I actually save for my composting. But you can recycle your food waste in there as well. So that's essentially a very low cost way to have a really big effective compost system at home and you can use pellets so you can pop star pickets in the ground and pellets you can use besser bricks as you can see from the photo um, chicken wire um, this is a, a custom wire cage that has little little twirls to to do it up and undo it um, so lots of different ways to compost and then of course behind me there. <laughs> um, you can see a compost bin which is the same as the one in the picture here the black triangular one um, so they're flat pack compost bins but really sturdy so they're easy to ship um, all around the world but um, very easy to put together and they do a really good job composting so when we look at maintaining a compost system we'll have a look at that one then of course there's other compost systems do, 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 do. over my other shoulder here you can see a bucket in fact I'll just walk over and bring it over to you. Uh, 
Okay, so this is called a Bakashi bucket. What Bakashi is, is it's a fermentation system. So you put your food waste into it and it takes meat, dairy, the works. Um, science experiments from the back of the fridge, anything and everything like that. Uh, and you ferment it in the bucket. And then after two weeks of fermenting, you can then tip it into a compost bin or into a hole in the ground. Uh, and within two weeks, you can then plant straight into it. So it's an amazingly fast and versatile compost system, but the only system that has a bit of a smell. It has a sort of a hopsy, almost like an apple cider vinegar kind of smell because of the fermentation. Then, of course, there's a whole range of um, worm farms as well that, again, you can make something yourself. Um, I've seen people bury polypi in the, in the soil and make just a little drop pit. Um, this is a sort of commercial version of that um, where you just dig a little hole and, and pop that in and the lid twists off and you can pop in your dog poo or your food waste or anything. There's a few different styles of that on the market. And of course, then there's your traditional layered worm farm, which you can see in the picture screen sharing. And I've got a couple of examples behind me. There's one just sitting on the ground there with no legs and then one sitting behind me with legs. Um, so in a minute, I'll show you how all those work. Uh, in terms of community options, as well, if you live in a situation where you just don't have a garden, you don't have the garden space, perhaps you're transient, so you're, you know, not in one place for long due to work, um, you might find one of the community options better for you. Uh, one option is Share Waste. It's uh, a group of people who got together and made this amazing website where you jump on and you either say, I have compost or I need compost. And um, you can just find someone on the map that you can drop your compost or your food waste off to. Uh, and that way they're composting it for you and you don't have to compost it at home. So that's another great option for people that just don't have the opportunity to compost and don't have access to the council green waste bin. There's also community gardens. So the community gardens are another great option where a lot of people will get together, particularly um, you get that sort of peer to peer support, uh, that learning, but um, access as well. So you get access to compost bins there, access to veggie beds and of course then all that community support to you know make it work well um, it can be quite daunting at first trying on your own so it's a really nice way to to do it as a part of a community does anyone else have any um community sort of options that they're using that i've maybe not covered you can hit the space bar to to comment if you need no okay we'll keep moving so composting 101, mastering the basics. So um, as you know, there's a, a lot of food waste out there. Um, and really when, or when councils or communities waste bins have been um, audited, so when everything, before it goes to the landfill, it's basically gone to a big depot and separated out into categories of food waste, plastic, nappies, so on and so forth, around about half in every council in metropolitan Melbourne is food waste or garden organics, so stuff that could have been composted that wasn't. So you can have a massive impact uh, on the environment and on the soil uh, simply by composting. So in terms of choosing a compost system, there's a few different, um, you know, few different factors to consider uh, rather than just saying, well, I want a worm farm. If you produce a lot of, say, meat waste or dairy waste, um, then a worm farm might not be right for you. A bakashi bin might be better. If you produce a lot of garden clippings, then a compost bin or a compost heap might be better for you. So think about the sorts of waste that you produce. Um, and I've got this What Waste Where fact sheet that you can download from both the Tryptopia and Compost Community websites. Um, also lifestyle. So if you want something that's really low maintenance, um, you know, a compost heap might be right for you. Um, if you want something that's a bit interactive for the kids, then maybe a worm farm's right for you. Um, other considerations are things like garden space. You know, where would you put it? Um, do, you, do you have a balcony that's really hot? Um, then maybe a worm farm doesn't suit, but if you've got a balcony on the south side of the house, then a worm farm might be perfect. 
um, just how much time you're going to invest into it and of course whether or not you want to buy something or make something. So there's so many considerations. Um, this fact sheet here that you can download um, just runs through some of the common waste types uh, and which systems actually best because a lot of people don't realise that you can put things like avocado pips in a worm farm, they'll eat it from the inside out. Um, so there are lots of different ways that you can compost different food wastes um, and you know you might find you need a combination of systems based on what waste you produce. So comparing the systems to get the basics right, um, I'll run through now the, um, the differences between some of the or some of the main differences with the systems. So I just need to make sure that you can see me where I am. Okay, that's got everybody in shot. Now I'm going to talk loudly. If you can't hear me, um, someone just hit the space bar just to let me know that you can't hear me um, because the background sound filter might actually cut out a bit of me. Okay, so in terms of location, a compost bin you can put pretty much anywhere. Um, my key tip on location is put it somewhere that's accessible to you. If you put it right down the back behind the shed, uh, then it's going to be out of sight, out of mind. You're not going to, you know, use it as effectively as you would. So I actually have one right near the back door uh, and right next to a veggie bed. So I have my little kitchen garden right near the back door, compost bin right beside it. And of course, other compost bins dotted everywhere. So <laughs> my workshops like this one. Um, so yeah, make it accessible. That's your main consideration with locating your compost bin. With locating a worm farm, hopefully you can still see me. Um, pop down so you can see my head. Uh, a worm farm, it needs to be in 100% shade. So um, under a really solid tree, um, so you know, a, a, an evergreen tree that's got really dense canopy is perfect. Um, under a veranda, under a porch, even in a garage is fine for a worm farm. So just, yeah, primarily you don't want it to get any sun in summer. As for a bakashi bin, These are designed to be kept indoors. Um, you don't have to keep it indoors. My chair's just in the way there a little bit, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to keep it indoors. These are actually designed, oh, just gotta let someone into the waiting room. Um, they're designed to just live under the kitchen sink to take all your food waste. But um, I keep mine just outside the door, so just under undercover. Um, because you don't want the plastic to break down from the sun and you don't want um, the heat to, of the sun to actually uh, sort of kill all the enzymes. So think of it a bit like um, creating yogurt culture. You don't want to overheat it uh, because that will actually affect the enzymes. So that's your sort of top tips on location. And then of course, your in-ground systems can go pretty much anywhere just over my side here, you can see the brown one behind me is called a sub pod. Uh, and that's an in-ground system that you can put anywhere, even in the sun, because uh, the roof or the lid is actually insulated. So uh, the worms have a lot of escape from, from that hot weather. Um, so in terms of the different systems, the fastest system, so looking at speed, the fastest system is Bakashi because you only need to ferment in that bucket for about two weeks before you then tip it out into the garden. And um, yeah, then you can plant into it within about two weeks. I'm just going to show you the contents so that it makes a bit of sense. So it's not, not as simple as just having a bucket and you know food will just ferment in the bucket. Um, it actually requires a special grain. You can use either a grain or a liquid, but like when you're making uh, yogurt or when you're doing any, any sort of fermenting, you need some sort of an activator. You need to introduce the enzymes. So this is um, a mixture of barley, grain, sawdust, a few other things. Uh, impregnated with uh, a, it's evaporated off molasses, but well, it's made from molasses, um, but it's full of lactobacillus and yeasts and all sorts of goodies. So just hold that up nice and close. So it's just a grain. So what you do with the bakashi bin, it's 
got a little drainage tray in the bottom. Um, you just throw your food waste in and for every kind of couple of inches of food, you put a sprinkle of the, the grain activator or a liquid activator if you prefer to use a liquid activator. Um, liquid activator is a lot easier to make than the grain. So if you're looking at saving money long term, look into making your own liquid, which is something that I do. Um, so yes, so that, that's a Bakashi overview and it's a very quick system. Uh, worm farming is quite quick because about a week after the food goes in, the worms start eating it. So there's sort of always a bit of a lag. Um, but within a couple of months, you'll start to get beautiful worm castings, which I'll show you. So what we have here, see it just almost looks like a beautiful rich soil. It's nice and crumbly. There's a few worms in there still. But that's your beautiful rich worm castings. So essentially that is worm poo or just the all the residue left over from all the fruit and veg breaking down. So, so it's fairly fast. Um, it'll be a bit slower in winter because they kind of slow down because it's so cold. Um, and then composting is probably the slowest system unless you're running a really hot compost. So in a standard compost bin, you'll find it's quite slow. It might take many months before you get any good compost out of the bottom. Um, whereas if you're running something like the cage and you layer that up with lots of beautiful, rich food wastes as well as your garden wastes, being larger, you might be able to get that running really hot. Uh, and if you run it hot, then it's really fast. So um, that's sort of how it goes with the speed. Uh, in terms of inputs and outputs, I've sort of covered a little bit, um, but the main differences is uh, well, how I categorize it. Is your compost bin great for most food wastes, except maybe not bread and meat? You can do bread and meat and stuff in there, but unless you're experienced to manage any issues that might arise, it's easier just to say, no, leave them out. Um, but it's also great for garden waste, obviously bulky stuff. Your Bakashi bin can do any food waste at all. Um, and I tend to reserve mine for that hard to compost stuff, um, like onions, meat, dairy, that type of thing. And worm farms, uh, I tend to save for all my fruit and veg, but mostly veg. Some fruit can get a bit acidic. Um, it's usually fine in small amounts. And I add things like eggshells and cardboard to the worm farm just to help level out that pH. Gosh, there's so much rain here. I'm worried the computer will short out. So if it does, I'll run inside and um, yeah, we'll work around it that way. <laughs> um, in terms of your outputs of your systems, um, out of a compost bin, you're obviously gonna get um, a bulk amount of compost, so great for, you know, bulking out your veggie patch and so forth. Out of your Bakashi bin, you'll get both liquid and solid. So the liquid you drain off and then water right down. Uh, and that, uh, it's sort of, it's almost like your cult, <laughs> your cult for your garden. So it's introducing all that beautiful microflora to your soils. So then your soils go gangbusters and then you have supersonic tomatoes and it's just incredible. But you really do need to water it down because it's very, very potent. Um, and of course you get the solids which you just either tip straight into your compost which will speed up your compost or dig a hole, tip it in, cover it over just to keep the blackbirds and things out and the smell in. You want to keep oxygen out uh, and then you can plant into that in a few weeks or two weeks. And then the worm farm, um, you get, again, you can get the liquid out of the tap at the bottom, which you can see in the little picture there. Um, I actually don't have my tap on that one at the moment. I just have it free flowing. Uh, and it, I do leave the tap open if I have the tap in. Um, but yeah, just pop a container underneath if you want to keep the liquid. Uh, and of course, those beautiful worm castings that I showed you. If you don't get liquid out of a worm farm, that's fine. It just means that the types of things you're putting in there are a lot drier. So things like carrots, obviously, are going to produce a lot less liquid than, say, watermelon. Um, and that's fine. You can actually make your own worm liquid out of the castings. So you can mix them around in the castings. 
So in terms of maintenance of the systems, I'll run you through the maintenance of each one. Inside. <laughs> um, I'll start with your compost bin. Make sure you can see me. Okay. So a compost bin is really simple to maintain. Um, just obviously take off the lid and then get something, either a pitchfork or a garden stake or a corkscrew it in and just start winding it down, winding it down and then pull up and then wind down and pull up and wind down and pull up. If you go all the way to the bottom in the first go, you'll be standing there. You feel like you need a, a crane or something to pull it out again. It's really hard work. So just chip away a little bit at a time unless you've got amazing upper body strength. And the idea of that is just to get air into there and turn it all over. The more you kind of mix it, the better a mix you end up getting. Um, that's really all the maintenance that's needed for a compost bin, unless you run into issues, which we will look at in troubleshooting. So issues um, might be oh, various bugs, um, you know, in plague proportions or it might smell or something like that. So there's other things you can do. But if you maintain it by just getting that air in there and if you're putting in a good mix of your green ingredients, which is usually your food waste and your brown ingredients, which is things like your leaf litter cardboard, then you're not going to run into too many issues because the brown things balance out the pH of the green things. You can get something like this. Got a bit of sun glare, sorry about that. Um, worm farm compost conditioner. So this contains things like garden lime, dolomite, um, in a powdered form, nice and convenient. So if it's not you know, suitable to go and buy a big bag of garden lime from the hardware store, you can get small things like this that are made up nice, nice convenient size for a small garden. Um, and just sprinkling that on as well can really help. So I tend to do that from time to time if I notice I'm getting a lot of little vinegar flies. Um, so with a worm farm, move my chair again. Tilt this down. Okay. So I should really show you how to set up a worm farm as well. <laughs> Uh, with the layers, you start off, the very bottom layer is your liquid layer. So that's where all your juice accumulates. If you make juice, mine, I run mine pretty dry. And then you have three, usually three layers, depending on the design. So um, basement, I, I use your liquid, then ground floor, first floor, and penthouse. So you start putting uh, your worms and your food waste in the ground floor. And then once that's full, add to the middle layer. And then once that's full, add to the penthouse. Eventually, all your layers will be full like this. And I'm hoping you can. Has it gone a bit quiet for everybody? I think. How nuts all those worms have gone into the water. So what's going on in this one? I've got a lot of grass looking material in this one. That's only because I breed worm farms, or worms commercially. I'm always trying to increase my, my worm breeding ratio. Um, but basically in the... That watermelon, as you can see, is starting to go a little bit festy. There's enough worms in there that it should be okay. Um, but in terms of maintenance, again, you're going to want to get in there and just make sure that that doesn't start to go mouldy. So I'll teach you the Adam principle. Oh, and we're sorry, with Bokashi, there's not really any maintenance. <laughs> just make sure you add your grain. So the Adam principle, Adam is an acronym for aliveness, diversity, air and moisture. So in terms of aliveness, um, just think about it as a living system. So I've heard horror stories of schools putting 
um, a bug bomb in their compost bin to kill spiders. <laughs> um, I understand that spiders can be scary, especially when there are kids involved, um, but it's probably more important to teach the kids to always wear gloves, um, not just stick their hands where they can't be seen. So use it as an education tool rather than just nuke everything. <laughs> um, because when you kill spiders, you're killing all the other good things as well. And spiders do a really good job in a compost bin because they're helping control populations of other things that might otherwise get out of hand. So you can see in these pictures, there's all sorts of bugs. Um, there's ants, which I find if, um, if you are getting a lot of ants and it's becoming a problem, your system might be a little bit dry, so just wet it. Um, you know, you'll get snails, you'll get beetles, you'll get black soldier flies, which are amazing composters. So you definitely want them in there. Um, you'll get sort of little microorganisms that you can't even see. In your compost bin, you may get worms as well if it's not running hot. Uh, and in your comp sorry, in your worm farm, you will still get a lot of these other critters move in. Um, so again, just don't stick your fingers where you can't see them. Uh, I tend to wear gloves whenever I lift mine up just in case there's a red back underneath. Uh, so yeah, just a bit of common sense and you'll be fine. With a Bakashi bin, um, you can't actually see what's going on, but it is a living system. So it's all microscopic flora uh, that's going in there and doing all that beautiful fermenting. So whilst the compost and worm farm systems are using oxygen to um, kind of breed critters that you can see, the Bakashi system is devoid of oxygen to breed things that you can't see. So that's the main difference. In terms of diversity, um, just sort of think about what would happen if you were to say, just pile up a heap of banana peels and watermelon, it would just turn to slush, it would be disgusting. Um, whereas if you um, were just to put in just dog poo or just newspaper, the system's not gonna really do much either. It's gonna be very dry and dormant. So diversity is about getting the mixture of both ingredients. And we can look more at the diversity of ingredients as we go through the presentation. Um, and of course, during question time, I usually get a lot of questions about, can I add this? Can I add that? Um, things like eggshells, I add to all my systems. Um, onion, uh, I will add to definitely Bakashi, definitely compost and very small amounts to the worm farm. Um, small amounts is okay, just don't overdo it. Worms don't like acids too much. So things like pineapple, tomato, citrus, and onion are quite acidic. Think about if your lips are a little bit sunburned and you were to eat something, would it sting? That's how it feels on the worm skin. So just keep that in mind when you're feeding some of that more acidic stuff to worms. But getting a good diversity of those ingredients, which as I mentioned earlier, we classify as greens and browns. Um, it should really be colorfuls and browns <laughs> because um, red things are classed as a green as well. So capsicum is a green, um, but it's just a really simple way of classifying two different groups of ingredients based on their characteristics. So your greens, they are often green. They usually got quite high moisture content and they usually got a very high nitrogen content. Your browns, they're usually brown, not always. Um, they are usually quite dry, um, but you can use them wet as sort of an antidote. Uh, and so they're dry, they're brown, and they're usually, well, always, um, very rich in carbon, uh, with the exception of dog poo is also very high in nitrogen. Um, so it's almost, dog poo is almost both categories in a way, because um, there's some crossover, but yeah, generally very rich in carbon. So having that, lovely diversity of ingredients, you're gonna get a system that's working well, that's not just dry and crumbly and that's not just slushy and moldy. Um, it's about getting them to mix. So I've done this little um, picture up just to show you a few items might be sort of on the border of greens and browns and dog poo, as I mentioned, might be one of those. Um, but your browns, you know, your eggshells, tea bags, newspaper, cardboard, ash from the fireplace, because I don't assume anyone has a volcano in their backyard. <laughs> um, even your nutshells and things like that um, are great browns. And of course, sticks, twigs, dry leaves. Uh, but then your greens, obviously, 
you know, most of your fruit and veg. Um, sometimes your garden clippings might classify more as a green than a brown because it might be fresh, really wet, steaming uh, grass clippings as opposed to dry, crumbly grass clippings. Um, so again, just a bit of balance uh, to keep that all moving along nicely. Air is the next one we'll cover. So as I showed you with the compost, um, you just need to get in there and aerate it with some sort of a tool uh, because as you add to it, things will compact down and that air will um, start to kind of squish out. So what you're doing with that corkscrew or garden fork is you're just getting that air down into there. Um, the same principle applies for a worm farm, except unless it's a big one like the sub pods uh, behind me here. You can see it very well. So that's quite a large in-ground system that can sort of take 15 kilos a week as opposed to maybe one kilo a week. Um, something like that, you would use a turner in as well. Whoops, sorry. Uh, dropped my mouse. <laughs> um, so, but with a smaller one like the layered one that we just had a look at, um, just gloves, just getting in there and giving it a bit of a fluff. Again, things will compact quite a lot. The worms will move through and create air pockets, but the fluffing up just really helps speed that up, especially in summer when it's really hot. Um, the more surface area you create by fluffing it around at night gives it a better opportunity. venti smell but um, the other smells that you may get particularly if it's used in an office space um, I've noticed it usually smells like coffee grinds <laughs> um, in an office space and often when I go to schools I find it often smells of oranges so you will get some of those underlying smells through but they're actually it's a pretty pleasant smell I used to be really scared of Bakashi because it, um, you know, it does have a smell and it's got liquid. And my first experience bringing it home from the office uh, was pretty awful because I, um, I'm just going to unshare my screen for a sec. It, <laughs> it was this bucket that I strapped to the back seat of my car and thought, you know, I didn't want to take it because I, I compost, I had worms, I had chooks, I was fine, but you know, you knew your ear, Proby. <laughs> uh, anyway, driving home, uh, lid wasn't on properly. It tipped over around the corner. It leaked. Okay, so this is six months now of the car stinking like apple cider vinegar, only worse uh, to me because I was so anti bakashi <laughs> Anyway, I got it home and um, had nowhere to bury it because I was on really hard clay soil. So I pulled all my herbs out of my herb garden, dug a bit of a hole, tipped it in, got it all over myself. Well, I, you can imagine the expletives coming out of my mouth by this stage because I did not want to take this horrid, horrid thing home. Anyway, got it all over myself, got it in, hosed it out. It was disgusting. I was gagging. Um, I was just, you know, once you've got a negative attitude in your head about something, it just gets worse and worse. Anyway, put the dirt back in, put all the herbs back in and took it back to work and was like, don't, you know, don't make me take that horrible thing ever again. <laughs> of course, a few weeks later, it was my turn again, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, so I, before I got it in the car, I put the lid on properly, made sure the tap was done up really well. Um, so I got it home okay. Uh, and then got to the garden, of course, had nowhere to bury it. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to have to add to where I did it before. Took all the plants out again uh, and went to dig the hole to make some space for it. And all I could see was worms, like more worms than I'd ever seen in a worm farm. And I was a worm breeder. Like, that was my job. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm like, hang on a minute. <laughs> so all these horrible things that I'm thinking, uh, my dreams come true. What's going on? And suddenly, I was hooked. I just could not believe the life in my soil uh, from this horrible, horrible stuff that I got all over me and all over my car. And <laughs> <laughs> and from then, I just, I smell Bakashi and I'm just like, oh, can I have it? <laughs> like, give it to me. 
Um, so it, it's really funny that it can be quite a daunting system because it does have a smell. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty sloppy and sticky inside when you open it up. But once you've had that first result, you hooked for life. Like it's like a drug. <laughs> So I am warning you in advance if you're going to try Bakashi and you're like, no, no, I won't get addicted. It sounds awful enough. Trust me, <laughs> you'll get addicted. It's pretty bad. Okay, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. If I can find it. Where'd it go? I'll just pop it back in my background. Let's jump ahead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry. I'm, I'm learning this technology thing really well, but I haven't learned a few of the shortcuts <laughs> to make it easy to move around. Okay, so that's the browns and greens, dry carbon alkaline. Oh, that's the other difference between them. The nitrogen or green stuff's usually quite acidic and your brown stuff's usually quite alkaline. So they balance each other out nicely. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's the Bakashi story. Um, so in terms of your moisture content, I, um, I have to do this right in front of me so you can see it. So these are my castings. So you're in your, both your worm farm recipe for liquid activator. Yes, I'll come to that at the end, Maria. Um, the... Castings that come out of your compost bin and your worm farm, you want them to be, I have to hold them up here because otherwise it'll cut out. Um, that just looks like dry and crumbly. So what you want is to be able to push it into a bit of a ball and have it hold its shape like that. That's slightly crumbly, but not too bad. Like it's pretty good. It's on the verge of being too dry as opposed to My next tray holds together really nicely, but if I squeeze it, you can't really, oh, you can see it running over my hands. You can see that water coming out. Actually, that's, I thought it was a lot wetter than that. It's actually pretty good. So like a kitchen sponge, when you squeeze it before wiping the bench, just that little bit of liquid you get out, but not just pouring out. If it's just pouring out, it's too wet. Um, so it's just, you just want it to hold together in a ball like that. Um, that's actually perfect. And then just that little bit of drips. The Bakashi bin, on the other hand, I like to run mine really wet. Um, different composters have different schools of thought. For me, it's, um, it's about being more effective rather than managing the smell. I don't mind the smell now. As I said, it's a bit addictive for me. <laughs> so um, some people like to run it dry because it doesn't have as much of a smell when you lift the lid. And of course it doesn't smell when it's sealed. It's only when you lift the lid. Um, but I tip in, so say I've just had a cup of tea or, um, or a pot of coffee, I'll tip in with the water and the grounds and everything. I'll tip that into the bin. Uh, so it runs really wet and that makes sure you've got less oxygen in there because all that water is taking up all those little air gaps and it ferments a lot quicker. So that's why I like to do that. Um, so in terms of troubleshooting and conscious of the time, um, some of the main issues that you'll get in a system, and again, we'll cover some of these in questions, um, is things like the little vinegar flies. So there's annoying little flies that fly all over your face and just float around in your kitchen when you've got overripe tomatoes. Um, something like that is usually an indicator that it's too wet or too moist um, or both. And so that can easily be rectified with your browns. So I use my browns dry to rectify issues of too wet, um, you know, too acidic. And I'll use my browns wet to rectify if it's too dry so that I'm not adding anything too acidic. So soaked cardboard, dry cardboard or soaked cardboard is your best friend because you can use it to fix most issues. Um, but other things that you'll find in your medicine cabinet are things like um, garden lime, dolomite lime, which is the same as much the same as what's in the worm farm compost conditioner. You can add some Bakashi mix to your compost bin or your worm farm. It just introduces some of those beautiful enzymes that will sort of help overcome some of the issues. Um, comfrey is amazing. It's a herb. Um, 
the traditional old old fashioned herb um, that's really, really high in a lot of different nutrients that really helps stimulate the activity in a worm farm, a uh, compost bin. Um, ash from the fireplace. Of course, blood and bone or anything really high in protein um, is basically like an aphrodisiac for worms. So if you want them to all be throwing their keys in the bowl and just getting to it, getting busy, um, throw in something a bit high protein like blood and bone uh, or dynamic lifter or meat meal or something like that and it will really get them breeding. Um, horse poo of course is great, um, but just make sure the horse hasn't just been wormed because if you are putting horse poo in your worm farm or your compost uh, and it has just been wormed, obviously the worm will kill the worms. So there's a withholding period of about two weeks after worming. So you can just keep it separate after you pick up the horse poo, keep it in a separate pile for two weeks, keep churning it and then add it um, if you don't know the owner and unable to check. Um, so in terms of harvesting uh, with the systems, I might just unshare my background again. And compost. I need a lower chair, don't I, without a back on it. <laughs> okay, so the absolute easiest way with a compost bin, um, you can lift these bad little doors and shovel out. Quite, quite hard. It's hard on your back as well. Um, so I tend to just give it a good old wiggle, push it in all directions. This is pretty empty because I only just harvested like last week. Um, but I lift it up and then I put it down next to it. And this is not really much in there at the moment. But if I had a pile of, you'd have the bottom would be all kind of ready to go. And the top would be your stuff that still needs composting. So I'd get the shovel and then shovel that top half back into the, the bin in its new location. And then you've got a beautiful pile of compost ready to go. So that's the absolute easiest way to harvest your compost. Of course, if you've got a tumbler, um, just empty it out onto a tarp or a wheelbarrow, depending on the style of tumbler you've got. Um, with your worm farms, that bottom tray there. So this bottom tray with the fairly dry castings, that's ready to just be tipped into the garden. You will lose a few worms when you do that. Like some worms will stay in there, um, but the majority are up where the food is. So I'll usually bait them first by putting something like watermelon or pumpkin up in that top layer, um, just to make sure all the worms go up there. <laughs> and that way I'm not losing too many in the garden. But there are some other ways that you can harvest them to, to get more um, you know, make sure you don't lose any worms at all, or if you still have a lot of worms in that bottom tray. In terms of the liquid, of course, all you need to do is open this tap for Bakashi and for worms. And of course, Bakashi, I mentioned, just dig your hole, tip it in, cover it over, and you're done. Um, so, uh, do, do, do. I just have to remember how to get back to my shared screen. I need to make different presentations that um, start at different points. <laughs> uh, so in terms of your worms, um, there's a great link that I've got up on the compost community or humcompost.com.au site showing this pumpkin over 30 days just disintegrating into nothing because the worms have just gone up inside and gone crazy. Um, yeah, it's really, really cool. <laughs> uh, and Bakashi, there's just an example there of tipping it into the ground or in a compost bin. Um, so if you do want to learn a bit more about composting, you can check out humecompost.com.au, which is um, the program we run with council. There's lots of resources, probably that goes into a little bit more detail of everything that we've covered today. So you just under the headings at the top, there's a section called learn and a section called toolbox. Um, so you can go in there and grab all those resources. It has links to share waste and so forth. Um, and of course, council subsidizes compost systems. So amazing subsidies from council, 70% off um, a compost system. So huge discounts if you're wanting to get started. Um, yeah, and lots of different options to try. So in terms of questions, I noticed a couple popped up earlier. 
So I'll just open my chat. Recipe for liquid activator. Got a feeling I've got it up on the website, but if I don't, it is, I buy the enzymes. You can buy it by the liter um, where someone else has fermented molasses, extracted all the goodness off and bottled it. And it's in kind of a dormant state. I buy that activator and then I reactivate it with molasses, organic coconut sugar, distilled water. Uh, and sometimes I'll add a few herbs and things like that. I will um, just basically do that in a big drum as needed on demand. It's it's amazing. If you're wanting to create it yourself from the molasses, I haven't done that yet because I'm just far too time poor. Um, but I will get that recipe up on the website if it's not already, because um, it's really easy. Um, how often should you aerate or turn a compost heap, not a compost bin? That's a really good question. I would. I'd kind of read the bin if that, or the, sorry, the heat, if that makes sense. So I'd want to get it to the stage where it's starting to steam and then turn it. Um, if you're turning it too soon, it won't get to that hot stage because you're cooling it down every time you turn it. So ideally look for that steam starting. That's probably a really good time to turn it. In terms of how long that is, you know, how long's a piece of string. If your system's really effective, that might start within a couple of weeks. Um, but if your system's really slow, it might take a couple of months. Um, and then once you've turned it once, then again, read your system, but maybe once a week, um, if you're that keen. Uh, I, I run um, lazy gardener sessions too. And, you know, I'm a bit of a lazy gardener because I'm time poor and I just don't have the time to do it that often. So, I think as long as you do it every now and again, it's absolutely better than nothing. How can you prevent pests like rodents from your compost heap? Excellent question. Okay. Um, so look, in, a, in an enclosed system like a compost system or bin, it's easy because you can just put down um, some barrier mesh. But in a compost heap, um, yeah, it's like it's free for all access. So um, I'll just unshare the back of my screen. Oops. Back of my screen, sorry. Stop share. Um, in a system like this, I would um, go through and just see how dry it is. The two things that rodents hate is um, they hate being disturbed, so they hate their tunnels being dug over. And they hate having a wet house. So I would um, get in and especially like this is just leaves at the moment. So they wouldn't be setting up very permanent tunnels. They'd just be kind of exploring it at the moment. But once this starts to break down and uh, is more kind of soil like, get in and disturb those tunnels as often as you can and get in and run it really wet. So whether you get the hose in there or just Tip in some um, bucket loads of rakashi, soak some newspaper, soak some horse poo, just get, get really wet stuff and put it in and then dig that through as well. It's just going to make a really uncomfortable home for them and they will move on. So um, I've had that, I've had success with removing rodents out of my compost systems that way every time. So um, yeah, I've never not had that work, if that makes sense. Uh, they just do not like the disturbance. Okay. Any other questions? No? Yep. So it's it's open mic for the next, I don't know, minute. If anybody has any question, not too keen on typing, they can just what is it, hit the space bar and, and answer away. I think we've had some really good questions so far though. Yeah. Look, if you do have a question spring up um, that, you know, you might sort of, uh, Murphy's Law, half an hour after the workshop, you'll be like, oh, should have asked this. Jump on the Facebook group or the Facebook page and ask. So we've got this online community through Compost Community with Hume where we try to connect people with each other. Um, and if you jump on and ask a curly question on there, someone else, 
might be online that's had that experience and can give you an amazing answer. So you're not relying on waiting for one of us to get back to you. Um, it's just a great community where you can share ideas together. So jump on that Facebook group, just look up Compost Community, um, both a page and a group. And yeah, we can help you out from there, but also jump on the website and use the resources. They're there for you. So um, yeah, anything we can do to help you on your journey. Yep. And if anybody has any other questions about um, FOGO or what council will be doing in the future for other sort of tips and tricks to reduce waste or help you around your home, um, please get in contact with me and I'm more than happy to help. Uh, and yeah, we'll send through the uh, slides and, and information from this presentation afterwards, uh, hopefully later today, just so everybody can, you know, have that refresher uh, with them. Thank you, everybody. All right. So there's just one what question. What was the email? Oh, what was the website address? Yes, yeah, I'll type it in here. Uh, www.humecompost.com.au. Uh, and so. We will send out, I'll send out this presentation as well, uh, or with this presentation on the last slide, which um, I've now removed, um, that has the, the web address and the links. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to link through from there as well. All right, yes. well, I'll get this presentation up. Um, I'll upload it to YouTube. Uh, and then send the link through to Jason to send out to you all. Um, but you will be able to find it if you stalk compost community <laughs> online. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, and yeah, you'll be able to find it once it's up. But I'll get that up this afternoon. And yeah, we can go from there. Do I need to put email address on this page? No. So you just, when you go to Hume Compost, um, just go in and explore. Just look at all the resources, everything. If you decide to order, um, then obviously we need your details because we need to deliver it. <laughs> but um, no, we're not like um, other organisations that ask you to sign your life away just to have a look at our resources. It's all, it's all there for Hume residents to yeah, learn. Cool. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I'll, um, I'll go and uh, yeah, start uploading this to the big wide world of YouTube <laughs> so that you can revisit it later. Uh, thanks everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank See you, you Ella, it was wonderful. No See you soon, bye.